good to go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In baptism, Robert was given a share in the death and resurrection of Christ. We commend him to the mercy of God and surround him with the church's prayer. May we all feast at the heavenly banquet. Let us pray. O God, almighty Father, who has strengthened us by the mystery of the cross and promised us a share in the mystery of your Son's resurrection, mercifully grant, we pray, that your departed servant, Bob, may be gathered into the company of your chosen ones, who our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. And I'm going to invite up our first reader, Tamatha, to share with us that reading. After this, I, John, looked, 
and there was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. And one of the elders then said to me, these are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat, for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord. Shall I? 
A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, we know that if in this earthly tent we lived in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, so we're always confident. Even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are always away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense for what he or she has done in the body, whether good or evil. The word of the Lord. Be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except And please be seated. Rumor has it I preach long. And you want to be seated, you want to be comfortable, just don't order pizza. My dear friends in Christ, may the Lord give you peace. Know that we are united with you today in sorrow at the death of Robert. It's with sorrow and grief that we gather today with the mortal remains of our brother to entrust him now to the grace and mercy of the Lord Most High. We gather also to support one another, to encourage each other with assurances of faith in the resurrection of Christ the Lord and in the power of his love. To you, Bob's family and friends, I extend my loving prayers and sympathy. We pray and mourn with you during this time of death and sorrow. May the presence of Christ and of his church buoy you up and give you comfort and peace. But I stand here before you this morning and I know that we're united with you in another way too, namely through faith. Indeed, if it were not for that faith, I would have very little to say to you that would be of any consolation or meaning. But we have faith in a God, a God who loves us so much that to prove it, he sent his son Jesus down to earth to be God with us. And God asked his son to die for us and for our sins so that when we die, we won't go to hell but we will go to heaven. If it were not for Jesus' suffering, his dying and rising, life would have no meaning. But Jesus was and is the beginning and end of our lives. It is he who gives meaning to our lives, especially at times such as this. God gives us the strength of faith 
that we need to carry the cross of Bob's death. And I have to say to you, I feel honored to be asked to preside and preach at Bob's funeral. But the reality is that no one can preach at our funerals. We preach our own funerals while we live. And this was very true of Bob. We see it in his commitment to the community, his passion for justice and the marginalized. Make no mistake about it, he preached his message clearly. And I'm sure that in the eulogy that we'll hear later, we'll hear further echoes of his preaching. On days like today when we gather, because a life on this earth has ended, we find ourselves being reminded that God wastes nothing of our lives. Not the good, not the bad, not the indifferent. You see, what God creates, God loves. And what God loves, God loves everlastingly. The great thing about your love for Bob is that it doesn't come to an end with death. Love continues beyond death. St. Bernard of Clairvaux said that those who are separated from their loved ones by death, he said of them, I can never lose one whom I love to the end, one in, to whom my soul cleaves so firmly that it can never be separated, does not go away, but only goes before. Nothing of Bob, nothing of you, Nothing even of me is wasted in God, nothing. Not our joys or our sorrows, not our successes or our failures, not the times when we were on top of the world or the times when we perhaps lost our way. Not the best in us or the worst in us, not the times when we were true and authentic to ourselves or the times when we betrayed ourselves or someone else, not our ups, not our downs. Bob will always be a part of those whose lives he touched while he lived. Each of you gathered here is a different person as a result of his life, his presence among you, his witness, his preaching. His life will continue to speak meaningful things to those he touched during his earthly life as long as we live. Bob has become a part of each of us. He will always live on in our memories. In many ways, it's like watching an instant replay on video. Every time you think of him, every time you recall stories about how his life and your life interacted and intersected. So keep telling those stories, keep telling them. And I know that there are many things that you haven't thought of in the last few days that will eventually come to mind. We're here today to celebrate the life of Bob, his life with us, but more importantly, his new life, dwelling, living, abiding eternally in the Father's love. Here's the thing. No one's life can be captured or defined by a particular moment or event. God neither edits nor wastes any part of our life. Instead, God loves us into the next sentence, the next paragraph or chapter of our life's story. God is always continuing the story of life. That's the reassurance that Jesus offers Thomas in today's gospel. You see, Thomas is lost, he's grieving. He's afraid. The thought that's at the back of his head is, how can we know the way? How can we know the way forward? And to that, Jesus replies, do not let your hearts be troubled. He tells Thomas and he tells us, do not let your hearts be troubled. And then he continues, in my father's house, there are many dwelling places it's as if Jesus is saying, life is changing, not ending. Do not let your hearts be troubled. He said such good words for a moment such as today, when somebody dies, especially someone who's been a part of our lives for many years. There's not only a sense of emptiness, 
but also the disturbing presence of unanswered questions, even if we don't put them into words. Things perhaps that we wish we had said but never got the time to. Things that we said that perhaps on reflection we probably shouldn't have. Amidst all of this, Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You see, we make that mistake of thinking that because we can no longer see Bob walking among us anymore, because we can no longer hear his voice, that something, somehow his life has ended. That's why our hearts are troubled. That's why Jesus tells us in our gospel, do not let your hearts be troubled. Bob has been taken up. He's gone to another home. And I notice I use the word home there. Life in these bodies, life on this earth is temporal. Sacred scriptures often refers to our bodies as tents. And for a while a tent can be a wonderful temporary home. When you're out hiking in the mountains, enjoying the wonderful outside, a tent can be exactly what you need. But when we become weary, we need a place to rest and be refreshed. And tents are ideal for that purpose. They're ideal and wonderful for their intended purpose. But few of us ever expects to live forever in a tent. Before long, especially when it rains or the temperature drops to zero, we want to go home. We want to live in a house we want to live in something more permanent and more sturdy than a tent. After Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled, he continued, in my Father's house there are many mansions, there are many dwelling places. I prepare a place for you, so that where I am, there you may be also. Tents are good for a purpose, tents are wonderful for a season, but they can wear out. The fabric becomes weak and torn, the poles collapse. And we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal home in heaven. Therefore, we're always confident and know that as long as we're at home in this body, we're absent to the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We're confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Probably nobody's given us a clearer picture of this, what it means to be a mature Christian, than that grand old man, John Quincy Adams. When that remarkable American was turning four score years, he was hobbling down the street one day in his favorite city of Boston, leaning heavily on a cane. And suddenly a friend slapped him on the shoulder and said, well, how's John Quincy Adams this morning? The old man turned slowly and smiled and said, fine, sir, fine, just fine. But this old tenement that John Quincy Adams lives in is not so good. The underpinning is starting to fall away. The thatch is gone from the roof. The windows are so dim that John Quincy can hardly see out anymore. As a matter of fact, it wouldn't surprise me if before winter's over, he had to move out. But as for John Quincy Adams, he was never better, never better. And with this, he started hobbling down the street believing without a shadow of doubt that the real John Quincy Adams was not a body that you could enclose in a casket or bury in a grave or scatter. He recognized that beyond the temporary physical man on the outside, there was a spiritual man, an eternal man on the inside. The flesh dies and is buried, but the spirit lives forever with God. And I thought of this story because I think Bob knew that too, with that same degree of certainty. He knew that he would be moving out of his temporary shelter, his tent here on earth, whether it was this year or this season or this month or another, he knew that he would be moving to a more permanent home, a resurrected body, a body patterned after Christ's own. You see, 
life is changed, not ended for Bob. He's still with us, and he always will be. And we can talk to him as we always used to, knowing that he'll be listening. In our Catholic tradition, we call this the communion of saints. Life is changed for Bob, not ended. He's still with you and always will be. And know that it's okay to grieve. Jesus did. It's natural. You love Bob, but we who believe have faith. And so we hope differently to those without faith. We grieve with hope. All of our readings today speak a message that reminds us who remain behind, who mourn Bob's passing, and Bob himself, and all who have gone before us will be reunited in a restored creation. When somebody we love passes on, there's always an element of sorrow, especially when you've been around that person for many years. That person becomes a part of your life. You miss them. But today, beyond our natural sorrow, there's a supernatural joy that comes from knowing the reality of Jesus, the reality of God's love, the reality of forgiveness, the reality of a new birth, the reality of heaven, the reality of eternity, the reality of future reunion. And that's why we're able to grieve, but we grieve with hope because of a love that's greater than death. And finally, I want to reassure you, Bob's love, his life, and his presence are every bit as real today as they were before he died. And I know it doesn't look like that. And I know it doesn't feel like that. And I know your grief and your tears are saying, Father, that's just not true. But it is, and I promise you that, it's gospel truth. His love, his life and presence are just different. But they're every bit as real as they always were. It means we just have to listen to see and to speak differently. It means we must listen with the ears of our heart. We must listen for his voice when it seems that silence is all that we hear. We must learn to trust that his voice has never gone quiet. quiet. And you'll hear echoes of it. You'll hear echoes of his preaching in his grandchildren, who he loved so much. We must trust that his voice has never gone quiet. We must be willing to see more than we think is there, and we must let ourselves be surprised, because we will be. We must look for Bob's presence in new and different ways. So keep telling those stories. Keep his name alive. Tell the stories of how his life intersected with yours. Tell of the way he touched your life and made a difference to you. After all, isn't that why you're here today? Never stop telling those stories. Here's the thing. These stories are not simply words. They create and call forth presence. So when you tell stories about Bob, speak not so much with your lips, but with your heart. These stories are not just a recollection of past events, a recitation of history. They're part of the never-ending story of God's life. Remember that God wastes nothing of our lives. None of this will end the grief that you feel today. And it won't undo what happened, and I know that. But it will renew our hope and our confidence that there's a way forward, even when we cannot know the way, even when we cannot see it, even when we don't believe it. You see, life is far too sacred, and the love of God and the love of Bob are far too strong for death to have the final word. He knew a love stronger than death, and he is known by a love stronger than death. That's what we hang on to today. That's what today is all about.
of you to share with us the eulogy. My name is Steve, oh. <laughs> also known as Beaver. <laughs> I'm at Bob's, uh, Bob's third child by five minutes. I'm one of the twins. Sarah's my, my twin. Um, Dad, I could use your help. He was really good with the memos. <laughs> Instead, my wife had to help me out with this. So, um, I'm going to share a story because anybody who knows my dad like to tell stories, and I am my father's son. When I was about 19, we were visiting a family member in the hospital, and while there, a nurse approached my dad because he was in uniform at the time and said, there'd been an individual that walked out of the hospital with some stolen, some stolen property from the hospital. So my dad looked at me and said, Stevie, come with me. I'm going to need your legs. You might have to do some running. <laughs> thankfully, um, thankfully he didn't, he didn't run. Um, I knew at that point my father wanted to see what I had and, and test, test me out. Um, so my dad had placed him in the police car and brought him back to the hospital. And while going through the stolen items with the nurse, the individual took his shirt off and lit it in fire in the back seat of the police car. So my dad grabbed his shirt and put it out and asked the man to step out of the car. Then he asked him once more, in that moment, I saw my dad morph into dad, into Sarge. <laughs> he put his boot on the side of the police cruiser, grabbed the individual with his two big hands, and gently peeled him out of the police car and grew. hear him say it. <laughs> he looked over to me and said, that's how you do that, Stevie, my boy. <laughs> oh, that was definitely a way to go dad moment. <laughs> my dad is stronger than yours for sure. <laughs> um, I was always proud of my dad. I was proud of what he did and how he served his community. I loved him seeing him from time to time in the hallways of my school, doing school presentation and classes, wearing his uniform. I was never ashamed to tell anybody what my dad did for a living. We were all proud of my dad, and this is evident in the fact that there's six grandsons with the middle name Robert. There was never a birthday, anniversary, Christmas, or special occasion that he didn't acknowledge with a letter in the mail, with cursive that only his children could decode for his grandchildren. <laughs> I can only imagine how much my dad spent on postage stamps. My dad had endless energy and a zest for life, running down up escalators, five grandkid trains down the water slide in the 70s, swan dives at 250 pounds off the diving board <laughs> without a splash, and uh, getting his motorcycle license at nearly 60. He was never too worried about what anybody thought of him. Dad was very much about tradition, football in the backyard, a bucket of chicken after a day at the Kenosi water slides, late night movies, the Barry Barn, letting me wash the police cars for a few bucks, and our countless trips to Minot and the station wagon definitely making the top of that list. So many traditions have been passed on to my own kids, like snack night, man-made wave pools in the hotel pool, <laughs> and offering my kids cash for back rubs, right guys? <laughs> My dad may, may not have taught me how to change the oil or use a saw, because that was not my dad. My dad taught me how to root for the underdog, how to be a good father, how to be fair, when to be stern, when to be silly, how to show affection, and how to make lasting memories with my family. He was never shy on the love yous, hugs, kisses, whisker rubs, even in my 40s. We are grateful to you, Lord God, for the blessing we've had to our family, 
and the time we've had with him for giving us the strongest, bravest, kindest, goofiest, warmest, and most loving dad. I love you, dad. So we definitely had some of the same experiences with dad, Steve. <laughs> I'm going to run a minute short here. Uh, anyways, thank you again so much for being here. My name is David, and I'm Bob's eldest son. Uh, speaking about dad today is obviously pretty difficult. As many of you know him, how can I adequately put into words this larger-than-life figure who meant so much to so many of us? Who was dad? Well, he was a son to his beloved parents, Dave and Molly, a brother to sister Vicky, a husband to wife Donna. Dad was a servant. He spent just shy of 54 years serving the RCMP. He was a father. He brought six of us into the world. Over the past week and in speaking to some of the folks fortunate enough to cross paths with Dad, I was reminded not so much of who he was, but what he meant to us. To his friends and those he worked alongside, I heard words and phrases like, Mentor, a friend like no other, someone who always had my back, a cheerleader, a force of nature, a guy who could really write a letter. <laughs> I was speaking to one of Dad's members, Andy, uh, that upon Dad's arrival up in the Pierceland detachment, that Dad was still using a typewriter. And keeping in mind, this was not like 1946. Um, <laughs> They said, or Andy said rather, that the biggest mistake they made was getting him a computer where Dad now realized that he could write memos at five times the rate that he could on his typewriter. Indeed, Dad loved to make waves uh, in the RCMP and his memos and letters accomplished everything from building better police detachments and communities through Saskatchewan to actually ma uh, mailing the mayor of Edmonton and getting a set of traffic lights installed on the street behind our house. So. I thought that one was pretty cool. Uh, to family, I think it may be better to start off with who we were to dad. In the days before call display, we, his family, and some others, well, we were targets. We were the unwilling participants in unsolicited phone calls from an anonymous someone asking, oh yes, hi there, David, it's Marv. Marv, oh yes, David, how are you today? Dad, uh, he did love his prank calls. And once he realized the jig was up, we were greeted with a boisterous calling of our nicknames. Big D! Wacky! Beaver! With a P! Annie! Jibbers! Dad tended to have a nickname for those that he loved. And as I understand it, he also had some nicknames for those he didn't care for. <laughs> but I won't repeat those today. Dad loved to talk, and while many of we his kids held contests and inside jokes about who's currently got the long-standing record for longest phone call, I believe that is Ashley with seven hours and 16 minutes, uh, these epic chats were only to be outdone by the amount of time that he actually spent with us. We were so spoiled with his love and his time. The supply of this was endless. As my brother said, he never missed a birthday or forgot a special event. And in this family, that's really saying something. When I look back, any attempt to properly inventory this ocean of rich experiences and special memories here today would simply be in vain. But these memories will be with we, his family, forever. Who is that to me? It's hard to pin this one down. But upon reflection, I realize that they connect to the three most important things in my life. First, Dad taught me to follow my dreams. From a fairly young age, I knew I wanted to be a long-haired rock and roll musician. <laughs> to be certain, no parent's dream career choice. But Dad, started with buying me my first black leather jacket while still in high school, 
Well, he supported this all the way. Driving me to gigs, bus tickets home when things fell through. I always knew I had a soft place to land. This support has given me the confidence to pursue with conviction the things that matter most. What a gift. He showed me how to be a loving partner. In the trailing years, it was remarkable and very cute <laughs> to witness my elderly father bumble around, acting like a teenager, nervous, mustering up the courage to ask his best gal to the high school dance. He had so much love for you, Donna. His relationship with you has been an incredible compass to help me navigate my own relationship. And finally, he showed me how to be a great dad. Life was such for me that I found myself largely alone in my, in my parenting duties. Dad played a colossal role in my son's life. Whether it was setting Tegan in his jolly jumper for hours on end listening to bagpipe music at 120 decibels, or a two-hour rush trip to Edmonton to help put on a birthday, Dad was there. He always was. My life was so incredibly rich in this regard, and I am so blessed to have been given such a sterling role model for this most sacred responsibility. My dad is hands down the best man I will ever know, and I get the sense that I'm not alone in feeling that way. This last week or so has obviously been a roller coaster of emotions. And the incredible memories with Dad continued right up to this last week. Just a few days ago, we all sat around Dad, whose consciousness at this point had been limited to just a handful of precious moments per day. We were telling stories, sharing tears, sharing laughs. But one such story stalled out as we struggled to recollect some details. We were talking over one another. No, it was, it was before he was in rejection. No, 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 wait, wait. It was earlier than that. He had moved to, to which dad, after hours of silence, piped up, 1963. <laughs> he was a sharp one. And that comment reminded me that no matter where we are or what we're doing, dad will always be with us. He'll be listening. He'll be guiding and he'll be loving. His profound legacy will live on through we, his children, his grandchildren, his wife, family, the wisdom he passed on to so many, and through the countless lives my dad touched. Till we meet again, Dad.
I invite up Ashley to come and share with us the prayers of the faithful. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and sits at the right hand of the Father where he intercedes for his church. Confident that God hears the voices of those who trust in the Lord Jesus, we join our prayers to his. Our response is, hear our prayer. In baptism, Robert received the light of Christ. Scatter the darkness now and lead him over the waters of death. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Our brother Bob was nourished at the table of the Savior. Welcome him now into the halls of the heavenly banquet. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Many friends and members of our families have gone before us and await the kingdom. We pray in a special way today for Dave and Molly, his parents. Stan Boyd and Stan, his friend. Grant them an everlasting home with your son. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, offer. Many people die by violence, war, and famine each day. Show your mercy to those who suffer unjustly these sins against your love. <clears throat> and gather them to the eternal kingdom of peace. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, offer. Those who trusted in the Lord now sleep in the Lord. Give refreshments, rest, and peace to all those, to all whose faith is known to you alone. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Family and friends of Bob, Daddy O. Seek comfort and consolation. Heal their pain and dispel the darkness and doubt that come from grief. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. We are assembled here in faith and confidence to pray for our brother, Bob. Strengthen our hope so that we may live in the expectation of your son's coming. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord God, Give us peace. Hear the prayers of the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, and the voices of your people, whose lives were purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Forgive the sins of all who sleep in Christ. Grant them a place in your kingdom through Christ our Lord. And let us now offer the prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Before we go our separate ways, let us take leave of our brother. May our last farewell express our affection for him. May it ease our sadness and strengthen our hope. One day we shall joyfully greet him again when the love of Christ which conquers all things destroys even death itself.
in baptism, Robert shared in the death and resurrection of Christ. May he be welcomed into eternal life. As a sign of respect for our brother Bob, we let this incense rise to God who has called him to share in his glory. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our brother Bob in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, he will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you have bestowed on Bob in this life. They're signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, Turn toward us, listen to our prayers, open the gates of paradise to your servant, and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and our brother forever. Dear friends, may every mark of affection, every gesture of friendship that you give to others be a sign of God's peace for you. In peace, let us take the remains of our brother to their place of rest. Amen. 